So hi guys, welcome to this lecture today. So today I plan to discuss India's agrarian crisis with you. I would like to share a lot of details as to why India faces the problem that it currently faces. So in today's lecture, what I'm trying to do is instead of like focusing on let's say the specific schemes run by the government or the specific issues within those schemes, what I'll try to do in this particular lecture is give you a background as to why there is an is, is an agriculture crisis in India. Is it something with the present government has done? Is it is it something that can be blamed on the governments in the past? Was there an alternative to this? And I'll also try to present a counterfactual in the sense that had we taken some steps that other, uh, let's say, economies of, uh, let's say, similar scale and and, and similar, uh, let's say, position as as we had in history, if if we had followed the same route, could we have seen India in a better place vis-a-vis -vis agriculture? Now, obviously, there are a lot of factors outside of the domain of agriculture that will affect how economies run, etc. I'll try to cover that as well. So I'd like to begin by talking about and giving you a brief background as to the history of agriculture in India. Okay. So as we realized by the time we became independent, agriculture was in dire straits and basically we had a situation wherein we had to rely on import of food grains from the developed world to feed our young, uh, to feed our people, right? So it's in this context that the first five year plans, et cetera, started working. And this is the sort of challenge that the first sovereign government of first uh, democratically elected sovereign government of India faced. So at that point of time, the primary issue was of food security, right? And to ensure that if people have enough food to eat, we tried to, the government at that point of time, tried to look at something which is now labeled as the green revolution. Okay. Um, so in the ninth, so as actually prior to the green revolution, what initially happened was as soon as we became independent in the 1950s, the government at that point of time thought that the sort of agricultural agrarian crisis we saw in India at that point of time was basically a result of, let's say, the existing zamindari practices, etc., prevailing at that point of time. So the initial idea of the government was to carry forward and carry out a series of land reforms. And it thought that if these land reforms are adequately carried out, a lot of the problems that Indian agriculture has been facing could be easily tackled with. So in terms of land reforms, initially right after independence, what the government did was initially it talked about abolition of the intermediaries, right? So the way that land holdings are structured in India, there were a lot of sharecroppers, tenants, etc., who were tilling the land, but the ownership of the land was with the elite land and hold, land holding classes and the government believed that this skewed relationship between these two classes and the sort of oppressive system that existed at that point of time was responsible for a lot of India's agrarian problems. So this started with land reforms, which began with the abolition of intermediaries, right? So basically at the time of independence, about more than half, around 57, 58% of the agricultural land was under the zamindari system, okay? And after <coughs> independence, a lot of uh, legislations were passed to make sure that modern India does and do, does away with this age-old traditional evil of the zamindari system, okay? So the first one came in with regards to the first one was the abolition of the intermediaries. Okay, then you had a lot of tenancy reforms, which basically said that there has to be a regulation of the rent in terms of the sort of rent that the croppers, the, the tenant croppers in those lands were made to pay. And the government tried to restrict the rent to not more than one fourth or one fifth of the produce. Okay, because the traditionally the rates had been very high, and the zamindars were basically exploiting these landless serfs. So then the government also tried to bring in reforms such as, uh, let's say, security of tenor. It ensured that the zamindars could not evict the people it, and, and, and it gave certain rights to the tenants who were farming in those lands, right? Um, then came a very important piece of legislation, which was the land sealing laws. And land sealing laws also, if, if you look at India, from a, if you look at the, if you look at the land sealing laws, it, there was a, turmoil that it unleashed in the society. Obviously, if you have land ceiling laws and if you suddenly wake up one day and tell the people that you own so much land that we want to take this land away from you and we want to redistribute it to other people. So obviously there would be a furor and uprising in the in the ruling, not in the ruling, in the land holding classes. And that's basically what we saw in the 1970s, right? So in 1972, the land ceiling laws came in and the government basically directed most of the states to 
have their own land have to come up with land ceiling laws which basically said that beyond a certain limit you cannot hold those lands so the idea behind this was fairly good it was meant to ensure that a lot of people get land some like uh, so uh, approximately let's say 90 so a lot of people at that point of time didn't have land and the government tried to redistribute this land so a lot of land was given to erstwhile landless farmers who had already been tilling on these lands so these lands were taken away from the zamindar now the problem is that this happened in 1972 however a lot of issues that we see in an indian agriculture today are a direct result of this land ceiling act and uh, before i continue with this lecture on indian agrarian problems i would like to say that the sort of problems that we see today in 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 agriculture in india are a result of the policies that we have undertaken in the past and i'm i'm not saying that these policies are wrong these policies made a lot of sense when these were formulated these acts and the laws that govern agriculture made a lot of sense at that point of time but indian agriculture is a victim of good intentions and unintended consequences of these policies okay i'm not saying that these policies are wrong when they were brought in at that point of time but what happens in india is that if you bring in a policy and that policy let's say sort of grants any small favors or any small advantages to people and after a time the state realizes that there is no point in continuing with these advantages it is very hard for any of the governments to roll back these specific particular policies because then there emerges issues of vote banks because of the sheer number of people in india any and every policy will have multiple effects on multiple sections and segments of the society and once you bring in a policy it is very very hard to roll back those policies so a lot of policies that government of india bought back then if we could somehow roll them back a lot of the issues that we see could be solved okay um so this is the background with regards to the immediate reforms that were carried out but the but then india being india we are a very jugadu nation we all we, we as usual came up with a lot of ways to circumvent these land ceiling laws etc right for example it, this was the first time that a lot of people started uh, grant like sort of granting properties to their wife right let's say the government comes up and says that a person a can only hold let's say 100 acres of land now somebody who owns a 1000 acres of land will transfer 100 acres of land to his wife 100 acres of land to his brother so on paper they would say that it's an it's a divided family but in reality they would be sharing the same household and they would be uh, partaking in the profits from Uh, agricultural cultivation in those areas so these things happened and then obviously whenever any land was grabbed by the state the constitution gives you the right to appeal to the judiciary and people filed cases in the high courts etc and during the time the courts put the stay on litigation these matter a lot of benami transactions took place right so benami transaction is basically when let's say i have 1000 acres of land and i i can legally own only 100 acres of land what i'll do is i will find someone let's say maybe like a poor person in a village who i have total absolute control over some serf that i have in my village somebody whose family has been like a cultivator for me for the last 200 years and i have sort of absolute social control over this person so i will name him the owner of 100 acres of land on paper so on paper that guy owns 100 acres of land but effectively that that land is my land so these sort of benami transactions took place and the government's intention with regards to the land so the intentions again were very good with regards to the land ceiling act but indians being the sort of jugadu people we have we are we circumvented these right so after this in the 1960s we faced a huge problem of food shortages and we were reduced to a very very bad state in the sense that we had to appeal to foreign nations to give food to us and this is the time when united states of america donated a uh, wheat to us but that wheat was like of a very low quality and that wheat was basically what was being fed to cattle in the us so in the 1960s the issue that we had was of food security our people were forced to eat cattle grade grain meat because we just didn't have food to feed our people right so the indian government looked westward and in the mid 1960s there is this very important person no named named professor norman borla i think has preparing for plat you should know this person he is called the father of the green revolution norman borla okay so in the 1960s he developed a high yielding variety of seeds in mexico so in the kharif season of 1966 india launched the hiv high yield variety program in india under the leadership of swaminathan ms swaminathan so ms swaminathan is known as the father of the green revolution in india okay now so 
under the green revolution the sort of gains that we made were immense in the sense that we were able to produce a lot of food and we were able to tackle the challenge of food security so this was a policy gone right but then we had unintended consequences of the green revolution which plague us today for example under the green revolution there was uh, let's say the the areas of punjab and haryana and western uttar pradesh where where irrigation networks etc were well developed and it was easier for farmers there to take advantage of the green revolution these areas prospered okay so these areas provided enough food to people but then it promoted a sense of regionalism in the country and the sort of areas that you today see wherein there is left wing extremism the maoist area these guy areas these areas and these people in these areas could not benefit at all from the green revolution it gave, gave impetus from to anti national and secessionist forces like maoists etc to operate in this area right so this was one intended consequence and another another in, unintended consequence was in order to feed india states like punjab and haryana started growing rice now if you are generally aware of history people in haryana and punjab did not have rice as a part of their normal diet because haryana and parts of punjab are fairly arid regions right and rice is a highly water intensive crop so because of irrigation networks because of let's say free electric free or subsidized electricity provided to the farmers the farmers started digging up water and they started depleting the underground they started depleting the water table so at one end you are producing rice and you are feeding people however then instead of effect instead of being the net promote exporter of rice states like punjab and haryana have effectively become net exporters of water and water is the resource that these states don't really have so this was another unintended consequence of the green revolution so as i told you earlier in this sort of presentation that i'm making i'll i'll be telling you basically how like there so there were certain policies that were very good they had very good intention but india is a victim indian agriculture in, in in specificity is a victim of these good intentions and unintended outcomes of these policies okay so this is basically the background that i wanted to give before i look at the sort of problems that agriculture faces in india today so i hope that you have a fairly decent idea of the sort of problems that we have now coming to the present day i would like to give you some facts and figures so that you are able to appreciate the scale of the crisis that we see today okay one second so if you look at the economic survey of 2019 agriculture supports about 58% of india's population okay but its share in the gdp is only 16.5% so for those who don't know what gdp is because when i was in 12th i didn't know what gdp is effectively gdp is the final cumulative value cumulative value of all the final products produced in an economy right so it's a measure of how good your country is doing in terms of the money and the value of money it is producing right so agriculture today it supports around 60% of the population but its share in the gdp is only 16.5% so if you think logically it basically says that 58% of the people are making only 16.5% of the money in this country right so obviously if you have such a skewed ratio then there is a problem that's going to exist in society these people will effectively be poor now if you look at the rates let's say of people partaking in agriculture in let's say europe or the united states it's about 2 to 3 to 4% and even though gdp contributes to let's say 5 or 6% of the gdp in those countries it doesn't matter because the population that is also deriving its livelihood out of agriculture is much smaller right so therefore the problem of poverty of farmers etc doesn't really exist at such i mean it, it, there are obviously issues in every country but the scale of the problem is really amplified in india okay uh <coughs> so if you look at these numbers and it becomes fairly clear that why it has happened is that over a period of years the development process that india has seen right and we look at india and we say oh what an admirable growth story now this growth story has left behind a very important sector that is agriculture so lot of growth is ascribed to non Uh, agriculture sec sector right and a lot of those the structural changes that took place in the economy took place in these non agricultural sectors and the wisdom of the governments of that day was to protect let's say agriculture from any sort of influences even when india became liberalized in 1991 the governments of the day decided that we need to protect agriculture and we don't want liberalization in agriculture as well so effectively what that has sort of led to 
is that as per government data in the economic survey of 2017 if you look at the average income of farmers from 17 states in india the 17 poorest states in india their average income is 20000 rupees now 20000 rupees per year is less than most likely less than the cost of the device that you are watching this video on right so that's the scale of the agricultural crisis in india there are families of farmers like four people five people six people who are surviving somehow on 12 less than 20000 rupees a year so this is where our prime minister speech become very important when he says that we really need to work towards uplifting these farmers and we really need to work towards doubling the farm farmers income now however think about it this way even if you double somebody's income from 20000 rupees to 40000 rupees in year i mean obviously it will make a large difference to that person but still that's not that's not the sort of development that we want to see we want the farmers to have way more money than this right so let me quantify in terms of let's say uh how far behind we've left our farmers and how developments in the non agricultural sectors have basically ignored any sorts of developments in the agriculture sector so if you take the year 1970 the minimum support price for wheat was 76 rupees per quintal so guys minimum support price we'll talk about it in, in detail later is basically the price which the government sells before production and harvesting just it said it says that irrespective of how much wheat and rice you produce i will give you this much money if you give me this amount of rice right so this is the msp in 1970 the msp was 76 rupees per quintal okay and in 2015 the msp was fixed as at 1450 rupees per quintal now this over this period of 45 years is an increase in 19 times right however most of us who are watching this video probably are not from this strata of society who actually cares about the minimum support price we i will come to the most more important parameter that you will be able to identify if you look at the same period the basic salary plus drs allowance of government employees now mind you that the farmers income and msp were raised by 19 times but the salary and da of government employees were raised by 120 to 150 times and if you're a college or a university lecturer your increase in income was 150 to 170 times okay school teachers by 280 to 320 times and if you're a corporate employee in the 1975 and if you're a corporate employee today the difference in income could be from 300 times to 1000 times right now this is 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 fairly shameful if you look at the sort of in, increase in income that we provided to farmers which is just 20 times the increase in the last 45 years if you compare that to someone whose income in the corporate sector has grown by let's say a factor of 1000 then that's a problem it it breeds inequality in the society okay so now i'd like to focus on some particular heads and give you an idea of the sort of crisis we face and the sort of deep structural problem that we have with agriculture right so in this video as i told you before what i've tried to what i'll do is i'll give you a conceptual i will i mean i will explain to you in detail and i'll explain to you the concepts behind the agrarian crisis now i'm assuming that if you're a serious aspirant preparing for cat you're also reading newspapers on the go and i believe what sort of government schemes the government has come up it'll come up with a lot of schemes in the future it it has come up with a lot of schemes in the budget etc i believe that you could find that very easily online in any of those resource materials etc provided to you i think the focus of this video should be to look at the root causes of the agrarian crisis but you can give your feedback later and if you want videos with specific data points and with more focus on stuff that is most likely to come in your exam in the sense that specific data specific names etc please give an adequate feedback and then we'll adjust the next lecture accordingly okay <clears throat> so if you look at capital now the major issue is that the sort of policy making that india has seen since independence and especially after liberalization now we've had a lot of economic reforms our middle class has grown we have become a very service oriented economy or like the service sector in india is thriving but the beneficiaries of this economic growth have been the urban middle classes and the export markets right and any sort of direct economic links between agriculture and the rest of the economy have been weakening for a long time now initially when we got independent the linkages between let's say the economy and agriculture were very very 
close and very visible because let's say for example in 1960s the green revolution came through then the farmers income rose and because and people got food to eat obviously and the farmers income rose and because farmers income rose farmers started buying tractors they started buying tvs they started buying radios etc so domestic consumption demand also increased with the improvement in agriculture right so agricultural economy at that point of time was greatly interlinked with the regular non agricultural economy but what we've seen in the last 20 30 years it really doesn't matter in 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 my agriculture economy has basically been delinked right so now now we are talking about farmers who average annual income is 20000 rupees and you guys who are a part of the non agriculture economy you are watching this on 20000 rupee devices minimum i'm probably some of you are sitting with max etc and watching this so obviously there is a complete mismatch and complete delinking of the agricultural economy with the non agricultural economy and this is very visible in the when we when we talk when we look at the sort of capital that that is required for uh, for let's say fostering any sort of economic growth so initially all those extra surplus capital would come out of the surplus in agriculture but right now we have foreign as in let's say if you're an indian corporate today the way that you get loans is you go borrow from banks you borrow from governments and you're also allowed to borrow from borrow from foreign institution investors but if you are a farmer in india today you are really not allowed to borrow from anyone and even if you're allowed to borrow from anyone the system is such that it creates a lot of systemic hurdles for you i will explain to you the hurdles in the coming few slides okay now another issue that we saw with agriculture is that india opened up in 1991 we liberalized almost everything but somehow we chose to not liberalize agriculture right so a our agriculture was not liberalized it wasn't real as in the the agriculturists and the farmers could not beat uh, reap the benefits of agriculture but the sorry of liberalism but they had to face the brunt of liberalism in the sense that india opened its own markets to agricultural products from abroad right so even today india right now spends a lot of money to import pulses okay now if let's say as in it's not making a lot of sense because india is also the country that wastes about 20 to 30 million tons of food grains every year every year there's a report that there will be one picture of people starving and people dying and then there'll be a picture of food grains rotting in godowns right so this is a sort of paradox that we live in in india and this is because of a lot of systemic problems that i'll highlight okay um so effectively what has happened is if you look at let's say the sort of capital structure that exists around agriculture and the non agricultural economy agriculture has basically lost its importance as a provider of capital for industrialization now capital is available from basically everywhere else except agriculture then agriculture is not providing cheap raw materials and food right because food is also being imported raw materials also being imported from multiple countries and agriculture is no more the market for industrial goods because the people who are purchasing a lot of industrial goods have nothing to do with agriculture all of us sitting here on our laptops consuming wifi enabled internet have nothing to do with agriculture and we are the primary market for goods the farmers are not because they don't have money right agar aapke paas 20000 rupees aapko saal mein mil raha hai aap kya hi market bana paoge like what is your sort of importance in this market economy so that's the sad reality that we live in now another very interesting issue is with regards to public investment okay so there are two types of investment one is public investment wherein the government spends money and and therefore you have like public schools means government schools public hospital means government run and government funded hospitals right so that is one model the other model of investment is the private investment model okay so there is a beautiful essay in the journal of agrarian change by mr ramesh chand and he he makes a very obvious statement in the sense that he collects a lot of data and he by he basically says that public investment in agriculture has halved since the mid 1980s however private investment did not come in and sub to sufficiently make up make for up for this right so let's say the government of india was putting 100 rupees in 1980 it is today putting an equivalent of 50 rupees and the private sector which was supposed to put in 50 rupees and even more is actually putting in less so the effective let's say an equivalent of let's say 60 to 65 rupees is being pumped into public into agriculture as opposed to 100 when 
most of the investment was being made by the government right so the private sector of see the private sector why will the private sector invest in agriculture private sector ko samaj sevar nahi karni na private sector has to make profits now obviously if you have an agricultural system where there are no profits then you will obviously not invest like let's say i have 100 rupees i have to invest in the stock market and as your company which has not made profit for the last 50 years i am not investing in that company right so that's a fairly obvious thing so you the government can say that we are let's say reducing the share of public investment but at the same time it's the responsibility of the government to make sure that there are adequate incentives for the private sector to come in the private sector should also have a decent return on investment it's only then that the private sector would want to come in okay now this is the issue in the sense that the public investment has waned and private investment didn't pick up now even with the sort of public investment that is there in agriculture that is also fairly problematic right so what happened is during the green revolution the most of the benefits were reaped by the large land owners and people who owned medium let's say size land had like land holding now these are obviously a minority of farmers right but these farmers have now become a very powerful lobby now the sort so obviously since the sort of country that we are politics basically decides there not in our country in every country basically politics decides everything right so these farmer lobbies now have a very solid vote bank and they are very specific in in the sense that they can basically issue threats to the state government sir aap aisa kar do agar aap aisa nahi kar doge to jo dusre cm the wo pichle saal jo the hum unko dobara vote de denge because he is willing to do these things so there are two types of investment that you can also make so agar mere paas 100 rupees hai as government i can invest it in two ways one i say stuff like theek hai i'll invest it in in short term gratificatory measures let's say i will say okay i will buy all the rice produced by you for 80 rupees now this is effectively how msp works the other alternative that i have is that i will not let's say i will leave you to the free market i will not buy crops from you but i will use that 100 rupees to dig canals i will use that 100 rupees to make sure that there are research facilities in those areas i will uh, invest to you and your fields regularly and i pay them salary so they they can advise you better now the problem here is obviously this is the most rational thing to do but if you look at india a politician's lifespan is only 5 years right and and that's that's because elections happen every 5 years but that's also a problem because in india if you have let's say elections in 28 states over 5 years there is effectively 5 to 6 elections happening in india every year okay and uh, and as you know the sort of political structure that we live in the power is mostly con- concentrated in the top heads of the party and obviously they have to keep all of these things at the back of their head while making electoral and political calculations so this is also one of the reasons that bold so called bold initiatives and and let's say schemes could not be launched because that would mean a short term agitation by these farmers and short term agitation means 2 3 months 5 months 6 months 8 months and by the time you could lose a few states in between so this is also an issue that we see in the indian state okay <laughs> and then if you look at the policy of minimum support price minimum support price also is only helping a very specific chunk of elite farmers right so under the green revolution basically states of haryana punjab and western up prospered and then you have msp there on wheat rice and sugarcane and to some extent you have states like andhra pradesh and tamil nadu where you have msp on rice okay now the state effectively always declares msp on 24 product but effectively what happens in practice is that 18 products are ignored and only 6 products are there are those wherein the state actually spends money in procuring these co- procuring these crops from farmers right so a lot of one second so crops like cotton oil seed etc in other states okay these get completely left out and because the support prices for these soils are very low and then there is a lower incentive for people to grow those crops now another unintended consequence of the minimum support price list is that so the government said that these are 24 25 products that i believe that farmers are generally investing in right because you also have to see a farmer as a businessman right you have to give them that sort of intelligence and you have to expect them to as in you have to give them that sort of an agency and you don't have to make patronizing decisions for themselves you for them you have to respect them as businessmen and uh, if you do that then you assume that the farmer is a farmer is a rational person right so if the state today says that i am declaring MS- 3 on 24 products and the state effectively then only 
is if is 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 able to execute MSPs effectively for six products, then obviously farmers all across the country will try to focus on those six products itself. Now this is creating a nutritional crisis in this country because over the years with globalization and with development, what we are also seeing in terms of nutrition is that the people's diets are becoming very monolithic. Like people are eating the same food across the country, people are eating the same food across the world, and it's it's so there are a lot of nutritional def deficiencies that we are seeing. and that's the reason why let's say so green revolution basically fed people people had rice and wheat in their stomachs but rice and wheat do not provide essential nutrition right so you had people who are surviving but then at the same time you had people who were stunted who were malnourished their mental faculties couldn't develop properly and that in some way contributes to let's say the sort of employment crisis also that we see today because a lot of surveys say that a lot of the indian youth is unemployable and they are unemployable because like nutrition does play a very, so so the first 5 years of a child's life nutrition really does play a very important role in terms of the sort of mental faculties that can develop and if you've just been fed wheat and rice because that's basically what the government has because that's the only thing that it is effectively procuring under the minimum support price and the incentive to produce other crops are eliminated so the state can only feed you with wheat and rice and if the state is feeding you with wheat and rice there is a severe limitation on the sort of intellectual growth that you can achieve and that's one of the reasons why a large section of the youth is un is considered to be unemployable so these are the sort of unintended consequences that i'm talking about okay now while we are at while we are talking about the issue of public investments i want to focus a little more on the issue of the minimum support price okay so minimum support price i think i have fairly explained to you is the price that the government sets it says that it so it tells the farmers before harvesting and before the sowing season that irrespective of what your output is irrespective of what the market conditions is this is the amount of money that i will pay you if you give me this much wheat rice or any of the 24 items that are mentioned okay now initially the idea of msp is very good because the idea of msp was to make sure that since a lot of farmers in india are producing these uh, wheat rice etc and let's say if there are any let's say if there is any sort of market distortions if there are fall in prices etc so we need to protect these poor farmers from the fall in these prices so the government came in with a very good intention that msp is very nice i will make sure that i buy this stuff from you and the procurement under msp is open ended so the government will have as long as you can give rice and wheat to the government the government can never say no it can't say ab mera quota full ho gaya i will not buy anything more from you if you are able to find that government officer who is supposed to buy from you and if you are able to hand him that product he is supposed to buy it from you at the minimum support price right so this was supposed to help out the farmers okay however the issue that became was that msp was supposed to be something which was supposed to be protective however because of the green revolution some farmer groups who were growing these crops became dominant and they pressurized the government to make sure that msps were set higher than the market price right so let's say the market price of rice in india currently is let's say 80 rupees per kg hypothetically right and the government says that so the farmers have pressurized the government to declare the msp of rice at 100 rupees right so all the farmers are incentivized to produce rice because they know that irrespective of what the market rate is there is some sort of security okay in terms of let's say the sort of money that i will get however if let's say the msp didn't exist then the choice would be left to the farmers and the farmers would then do some market studies and field studies and realize acha pichle season mein pyaaz ka dam ye tha pichle season mein tomatoes ka dam ye tha so maybe if i let's say diversify let's say 70% mein mai rice hoga but in the 30% let me try with some other thing so the mar so the farmers could take certain risks out of that and maybe diversify his income let's say there is a failure of rice crops there is a glut in the demand for rice crops that suddenly the price of onions is shooting up so obviously the farmer could then use market forces and sort of hedge hedge his or her risk right but that didn't exist because the farmer lobby was fairly strong and they have basically forced states like haryana and punjab to declare A very high MSP on these uh, goods. Now, because there is very high MSP on these products, states which have traditionally not grown these products are growing rice and wheat, right? So, as I highlighted earlier, the problem with growing rice in Haryana and Punjab is that there is 
as in these states are becoming a net exporter of water then these products also require heavy use of fertilizer so the land over by because of excessive irrigation and because of excessive fertilizer use the per square kilometer per hectare yield is also decreasing over the years so the land is also becoming less productive and these are the sort of unintended consequences that we are seeing right and on top of that it is not that the msp is a a uh, very effective let's say mechanism right because msp as i told you is declared on 24 crops effectively the government ends up procuring only six six of them and that also in a very limited manner so the actual number of farmers who benefit out of msp is effectively 5 to 6% of the farmers anyways so 90 95% of the farmers don't really benefit from msps anyways right so remember i talked to you about two sorts of investment that investments that you can have here is one is in the short term gratificatory measures like msp and the other would be long term capital investment right so let's say only 5 to 6% of the farmers are okay so let's say it costs 1000 rupees for the state to buy all of these uh, rice and wheat under the msp scheme right but the only 5 to 6% of the farmers are benefiting out of it and these are the farmers who are already fairly rich right they are rich they have good social contacts they have good let's say hold and influence and these are the only ones that are able to sell to the government now instead of this if the government spent that 1000 rupees in let's say creating ponds in villages in let's say bringing scientists to these villages to advise these farmers to make sure that they grow different types of crops and give them effective training on advanced farming practices introduce certain uh, certain kinds of technologies to these fields okay then the outputs generally would be better and more farmers could be benefited right however because of the pressure of these farmer lobbies a lot of investment a lot of money is being wasted in schemes like the msp okay then you have the issue with irrigation in india so according to the economic survey of 2017 only 33.9% of the total crop area is irrigated right rest of the area is effectively working ram bharose ki agar barish aa gayi to bahut badhiya we will have a good yield right so somebody has effectively also said that the actual finance minister of india is the monsoon right because your budget is also decided by how much it rains if there is a good monsoon gone good monsoon then the government predicts that uh, the farmers would be able to sell these goods better or there will be a general let's say uh, i know there will be a will be a jovial economy and people will have more money to spend and if the monsoon is bad then they also automatically make adjustments in the budget in terms of the let's say the sort of investment that they'll have to make the sort of taxes that will be that they'll be able to collect so now obviously it is very logical to say that irrigation facilities have to be provided like you can't have just you can't have irrigation for 40% of the cropped area and let 60% of the land be ram bharose right like you have to have irrigation uh, uh, this thing uh, irrigation canals etc have to be created now one of the schemes that government of india currently and not currently it's been uh, it's been in the pipeline is that they want to work on the interlinking of rivers now interlinking of rivers i suggest is something that you read separately also but what basically they are saying is that a lot of water from a lot of these large rivers is draining into the way of bengal and arabian sea anyway and there are a lot so they are saying that india is one such country where there are droughts and then there are floods at the same time so the government's idea and, and is that if you interlink these rivers then you can manage these water resources better but i think a that's a huge waste of money because ek to the glaciers are receding every year global warming is making sure that there is reducing the flow of rivers then another issue is that you are also india growing india also has a large electricity demand right and we want to shift to hydro power projects from thermal energy i think i have told you no i haven't but if you look at the let's say so if you look at electricity in india right 60% of electricity in india is produced from coal so next time when you are thinking of buying an electric vehicle it is very likely ki that bijli that you are getting running the electric vehicle from is coming from a coal plant where some coal is actually being burned so you are not really doing that much for the environment right so india also wants to shift from 60% electricity coming from thermal power plants to other more renewable sources of energy and hydro electricity is one of the best bets now the issue with hydro electricity is that if you build dams on these rivers then the water flow is anyways going to be reduced and there are also a lot of ecological consequences to linking these rivers so i suggest that instead of thinking of these grand ideas what people should focus on is that they should look at local level management such as uh, have uh, they say uh, like emphasis should be given on reviving local ponds wells and investing in small watersheds so that irrigation can be maintained better 
and i think it is the right time for india to take these steps today because a there is a migrant worker crisis there is absolute joblessness right now in the society there are a lot of people hard working laborers who migrated back to their homelands right and they left these homelands because in the first place agriculture could not provide adequate livelihoods from them right so agriculture was bad therefore they left these homelands to work as laborers in other states now when these laborers has have come back and when there is general glut in the economy one of the ways to revive if the economy is to is through government spending right now i i believe that if the government tries to spend through manrega then i think it's it hits two birds with a stone you provide employment to these people in in these harsh times you give them some money in their hands the moment you give them some money in the hand they will start going to the market they will start purchasing goods then it will restart the economy so one is this angle and while you are doing this you also make sure that a lot like more than 33.9% of of the area in your country comes under irrigation and therefore agricultural productivity could be better so you can have you can save these migrant laborers from hunger you can improve agriculture in india and you and it also helps you to go towards the aim of doubling farmers income by 2020 or 2022 whenever you plan it to be okay so this, this was another issue then an obvious issue is with regards to the declining size of average farm holding right so let's say in 1950s i had 100 acres of land but and in 1950s the fertility rate in india in some of the states was very high so let's say i had five sons now i don't have money to educate these sons i am anyways a poor farmer so what do i do when i die i give my land to these five sons now all my five sons just have 20 acres of land so let's say i at least had one acre of land and i had to feed let's say me my wife my 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 parents so that's four people and these five sons so i had to feed nine people but now these sons they have their wife then they have their children and they only have their 20 acres of land so obviously because of the diminishing size of land there is a term in economics known as the economy of scale so the larger your business operation is you are able to save on certain cost because of the monstrosity of your enterprise and that is where you make profits right so now i don't see how these people can make profits because their land holdings are reduced to 20 acres and now these kids also have three four sons more so in the next generation you'll probably have someone with a land holding of five acres six acres and it's not going to make a lot of economic sense right so that is another issue so a lot of you might think right, might be thinking right now that then there's an easy solution to this these people can sell these lands these people can migrate to the cities well the answer is no because there are certain well intended policies right let's uh, uh, which which the government came up with which served their purpose in the 60s and the 70s but right now these specific policies are preventing these farmers to sell their land right so let's say there is someone who decides that mere papa to 100 acres pe khedi karte the unka kaam chal raha tha but now i have 20 acres of land aur mera kaam nahi chal raha if i want to exit as a farmer it is very sad that the state does not provide me an exit option right so farmers cannot exit farming in india today so i'll tell you why exactly now since i have talked about it let's skip these two three slides i'll come back to these slides later now let's look at the freedom of choice that the state is denying to these farmers right so the primary issue that i have with irrigation of with agriculture in india is of over regulation now the thing is people are very ignorant about this because for example if i ask you today in this video if i ask you what do you think is the most over regulated sector in the indian economy you would be quick to say oh banking and finance insurance etc but you will be surprised that every aspect of agriculture is controlled right from credit to land to inputs like water seeds and and even the markets of agriculture are regulated right so there is an act called the apmc act under which the first sale by the farmer has to be made in that particular mandi only so the farmer has a no choice in terms of capital then b he can't sell his land <laughs> then c he can't sell his fruits and vegetables the way he wants to so these over regulations are crippling these farmers and i'll try to discuss these sort of over regulations with you right now so <coughs> so what over regulation so, so the reason why there is over regulation is that because at the time of independence it is true the indian average indian farmer was illiterate and there were a lot then there were a lot of predatory let's say people and policies and organizations that the government had to protect these farmers from but now i think it's time it's 2020 the farmer is also educated a large section of the farmers are educated these farmers want to try something new but because of the restrictive policies that might have served their purpose in let's say 1940s and 1950s and 60s in the sense that they protect farmer from these shady 
smart urban people now is the time when we need to accept the fact that these farmers are not children they are not naive they are adults and they have agency we need to give them this freedom to make these choices right so the reason why this happens is because of this sort of ivory tower elitist approach that we have to policy making so the people who are making agricultural policy in india for the last 30 40 years they have absolutely nothing to do like there's an anecdote that a friend of mine shared with me so this guy was working with some government agency and he had gone to a field to discuss matters of let's say to gain inputs from the farmers because they wanted to frame some sort of farming policy for these people now the farmer asked this this a young friend of mine same age 27 years old and the farmer asked him a very simple question this is in haryana he's like chore ye bata de moongfli jo hoti hai wo zameen ke niche hoti hai zameen ke upar hoti hai and my friend who was supposed to draft and give suggestions on policies regarding farming usse ye nahi pata ki moongfli zameen ke upar hoti hai zameen ke niche hoti hai and these sort of people are drafting policies for these farmers and, and that's where the problem is stemming from so this is one anecdotal example which clearly points out that the people who are responsible for drafting and forming these policies really don't have an idea as to what is going on at the ground level okay so <clears throat> now now with regards to so as i told you right even if the farmer let's say who now has 20 acres of land he wants to quit but he can't because uh, so the thing is a lot of states have passed this law that you can't sell agriculture land for non agricultural purposes right and that's where that, that, that's where there's a huge problem right because let's say a to i can't sell this land and move out because who will buy land only farmers can buy this land now think about this i am a farmer i want to quit because farming is not making me money how do you expect that there will be other farmers in this same system and this economy who have the money to buy my land so obviously nobody has the money to buy their agricultural land as well so the market prices of these agriculture land are very sad like sad is actually the word that i'll use for it now the way that someone can sell this land is that first they go to some government officer then they get the land use pattern like changed in the in the revenue records and only then they can sell this land but obviously a farmer who is having difficulty to survive does not have the contacts to make sure that this large process can be held without paying huge bribes now the issue with this is that it's not that the agriculture land is not being used for industrial purposes right the government of india will come in they will buy land from these farmers at agricultural rates then they will change the land use pattern on the certification of this agriculture to industrial land and then they will sell this industrial land to large industries and make a lot of money so if you had followed the news the alleged dlf scandal wherein robert watra was involved was basically this that he had purchased agriculture land from a lot of small farmers okay and the allegations was that after he purchased the land from the small farmers he got because obviously he got the land use pattern changed and then the land was then classified as industrial slash real estate land and then this land was sold off to realtors and industries and a large profit was made now this is the problem right let's say i am a farmer and i want to quit mere ko nahi karni base acre mein kheti i maybe want to start a business in the city i maybe want to become an entrepreneur now banks won't give me any loan because the reality of loans is that they go so for loans you need two things you have to first of all give the purpose of the loan and second of all you have to have a valid collateral for this loan right so now the problem with agriculture is the banks also know that agriculture land can only be sold to other farmers and now the banks know that if this farmer is coming to me for a loan and the collateral is this piece of land the banks are also really not interested in giving this land right let's say i am a bank i loan you 100 rupees and tomorrow you are not able to pay me this money so now your land might be worth 100 rupees but as a bank where do i find the farmer to sell it to is there going to be a farmer who will be willing and the sort of social cohesion that exists in the farmer community let's say so we are looking at it from a very urban perspective right let now let's go back to the villages there's a sense of community over there so let's say i am a bank i have lent money to someone now i confiscate his land and i now say this land is up for sale now let's say his land is right in the middle of the village it is surrounded by villagers ka land now the villagers decide that ye to apna banda hai ho gayi isse problem we don't want to buy this land what does the bank do right now 
no industrialist is going to come and buy agricultural land in the middle of the village nobody from some other village will come and buy land which is surrounded by villagers land here so the only people who can buy this land are the villagers in that particular village and they decide that they don't want to buy the land so obviously then the banks have less of an incentive because the banks also know that agricultural land can only be sold for agriculture purposes and the banks think that in case that this farmer goes bankrupt there is nothing that i have this collateral that i might have on paper it's of no value to me because i can't realize the cost of the loan so this is one issue okay then another issue is that as per the land records if the farmer is recognized as a land holder then and the state does not allow him to sell off all his land right so the idea behind this was very good the state realized that देखो लॉ एक चीज होती है एंड सोशल प्रेशर आर डिफरेंट राइट सो लेट्स से इन द सिक्सटीज फिफ्टीज वेन दे हैड स्टार्टेड अबॉलिशिंग जमींदारी स्टेट रियलाइज दैट इट इज वेरी पॉसिबल दैट वंस वीव नाउ गिवन वीव कैप्चर दिस लैंड फ्रॉम द जमींदार्स एंड वीव गिवन टू द लैंडलेस फार्मर्स टू यूज टू वर्क फॉर द जमींदार इट इज वेरी लाइकली दैट यूजिंग हिज सोशल क्लाउट एक्सेट्रा द जमींदार माइट बी एबल टू गेट दिस लैंड बैक फ्रॉम दीज पीपल सो द स्टेट सर दैट इफ यू आर ऑन रिकॉर्ड इफ यू आर अ लैंडेड फार्मर देन आई विल नॉट अलाउ यू टू let's say become landless now it is a very good step from the state at that point of time because they, they, this was the sort of that the sort of issue that i explained to you this was what the thought was behind this but now those practices have evaporated now let's say i'm someone who's left with 5 acres of land out of my grandfather's 100 acres now i can't sell this land because as per the land revenue records i am a landed farmer and the law itself prevents me from becoming a landless farmer so now this is also a big issue that i have so i don't have an exit option now i can't take a loan from the bank for any other purpose because the bank knows that if the business if any let's say i take a loan for an enterprise and i want to run my own business the bank won't give me the loan right because the bank will say a you are a farmer we have no idea whether you can be a successful entrepreneur or not and if you are not a successful entrepreneur what will i do with agriculture if i make a agriculture land in the middle of a village and most of the land will belong to your chacha taya and your cousins anyway so they might not want to buy the land from the banks and the banks pretty much not be not, not going to be able to do anything and right? so this is one issue with over regulation one second now because of this there is a dual burden on the farmer right because the farmers can't exit the farmers can't let's say have corporations come in because initially like government did not want corporations the uh, corporatization of the agriculture as well because they believed that the corporates might loot the farmers bhole wale farmers ko they might be able to misguide could have made sense in the 1950s but things on the ground are very different today right so they didn't allow corporatization of agriculture and because of that and continue and because of let's say land fragmentation the farmers were deprived of benefits of scale okay and now what is happening is that the farmers are being forced to be a good farmers and at the same time they are supposed to be excellent entrepreneurs as well right so there is this dual burden on the farmers that has been created by state policies ek to aap kheti bade acche se karo uske baad you be such a good entrepreneur and a manager and a marketer that you are able to make money out of this as well right so this is an additional pressure that is being put on the farmers this dual burden now some steps are being taken because now contract farming is legalized farmer producing organizations can now come up so basically farmer producing organizations are like cooperatives let's say you have amul which is a milk cooperative there are a lot of people who produce milk in a certain area give it to some vendor and they give it to amul and then amul <coughs> uses the economies of scale and makes product similarly farmer producing or farmer producer organizations have come up okay which and down they can take the nature of a company or a society as well in law so some some steps are being taken here but coming back to the issue of dual burden now you have a dual burden to be a farmer and an entrepreneur obviously most of the farmers are not going to be able to do this now let's say out of 100 farmers there is one very smart guy who does both he becomes a very good farmer and he also becomes a very good entrepreneur which means that he is running his business successfully he has money so now he wants to expand his business but now comes in the beautiful land ceiling act of 1972 the purpose of the land ceiling act was amazing you can't have land beyond certain acres because otherwise how will we abolish zamindari system but now let's say there is a person in the market who's a great entrepreneur he's cracked the game he knows how to farm and make money 
so he can't buy land from other farmers because they can't become landless on record then even if he is able to buy some land from these farmers he can't legally own land more than x acres this is decided by every state so let's say state of punjab decides hypothetically that no one can own more than 50 acres of land now i am an entrepreneur i started with 5 acres of land now i have 45 acres of land i am making good money now i want to expand but i can't because the land ceiling act says that i can't have more than 50 acres of land so in spite of the fact that of this excessive burden on me mai badi mushkil se if i have succeeded also then i can't expand so the benefits of scale are now being denied to me as well right so it is very interesting that such land ceiling laws on capital see in agriculture land is the capital right so these land ceiling laws don't exist anywhere for example corporations today can raise money from the international markets and recently there was an issue of sovereign bonds where government of india itself wanted to raise credits from overseas now there is a government which today says that i am willing to let make sure that the corporate sector can raise money overseas i myself might want to raise money overseas but the farmers can't raise any money overseas farmers ko hum we will place <coughs> absolute restrictions with the only form of capital that the farmers have which is land okay so this is an issue that plagues farmers in india then there is an issue of inefficient production now this issue of inefficient production is linked with the msp regime and the sort of subsidies that are given and the sort of politics that works around uh, farmer lobbies etc right and as i told you punjab is an arid piece of land rice should not be growing there but because of msps that are provided by the government of punjab which is at the behest of the rich powerful farmers in punjab and the farming lobby in punjab is very strong so they provide good msp for rice so in spite of the fact that punjab should ideally not grow rice because rice should be grown in areas where there is water right punjab is practically undergoing desertification there are multiple issues that punjab is facing with regards to depletion of water tables salinization of soil all all of that specifically can be pointed out to rice but because of the sort of skewed political nature of these crops the gum the government has no no other option okay now <coughs> one issue just let's focus specifically on the example of punjab i'm sure similar examples are prevailing in other states so a the government of punjab cannot remove the subsidy now the second thing is punjab in punjab is that since the farmer lobby is very strong the government of punjab gives basically free electricity to the farmers now the issue with giving free electricity to the farmers is the farmers now realize that i have free electricity i can keep my tube well or bore well running for 24 hours a day i can take out as much water from the from the water from underground and i can and deplete the water table because kya hi farak pad raha hai this bijli is free so there is no incentive for the farmer to even switch off the pump and not need it so a lot of water is that way is going wasted and the issue is that if let's say tomorrow there is a government in punjab which says that from tomorrow you'll have to pay money for electricity then the government doesn't exist after 5 years so that's another issue so <laughs> the government gave up with this policy because it wanted to let's say help the farmers by saying that, oh use is the electricity we might it might increase your income but now this is being misused and if the government now the government also realizes that this is being misused but the fact is that it's it's a very emotive issue right i it's it's very hard for a government to now come and say that oh up to bijli free thing you have to pay for it because uh, then there are certain political issues with that so then you have ecological problems like this and now another interesting thing we are all aware of the sort of pollution that delhi faces right so punjab mein rice ug raha the way that you harvest rice is that 5 to 6 inches of rice is left after harvest have been harvested now the easiest way to get rid of this this is called prali in local punjabi is to burn it now when you burn this prali there are winds western disturbances which come from mediterranean sea etc and they are flowing towards delhi now they will carry all of this pollution to delhi and now you have himalayas on this side which blocks all the pollution there so you have an influx of pollutants into delhi and delhi can't do anything about it because the state of punjab cannot disincentivize its farmers from producing rice so this is another unintended consequences that people of this country have been facing because of in, like the sort of agricultural stances and policies that india has taken right now similarly you have a problem of sugar cane in maharashtra sugar cane again is an extremely water intensive crop okay now maharashtra also has a lot of dry regions 
so there in also a lot of sugar cane is being grow, uh, is grown and india is exporting rice to let's say iran india is also exporting sugar cane so india is now becoming a net exporter of water ab aisa nahi hai that we have so much water that we can export water we ourselves have a large scarcity of water however in spite of that because of the political economy surrounding these crops india is now becoming a net exporter of water so this is another unintended consequence of the sort of policies that are in that the indian state has taken up okay uh now let's talk about the issue of avail availability of credit so the issue of availability of credit can be linked with the sort of uh, laws let's say that i explained to you the banking problem right so banks will give you loan if you can give them collateral so the only collateral that you can give them is agriculture land and the banks know that there's no point in taking agriculture land as collateral because who will i sell it to so the banks are not willing to loan to these people so now these people have to fall back on the money lenders and their traditional uh, money lenders that exist in the villages now a bank might be giving you an interest loan at an 8 9 10 12 percent rate the money lender he knows that the farmer is coming to me because the bank will not give him a loan so obviously he is going to charge a premium now this premium can be as high as 25 30 percent so that further puts the farmers into a debt trap right so statistically speaking less than half like about 47 48% of the farmers actually get loans from formal sources most of the other loans are from money lenders arathias etc and that's also creating a large problem and even when these loans are given from a formal source these are given for short term uh, loans right so these are loans on the crop and the crop is a collateral right so so collateral might be land but the so loans the way that you take loans also is that i can't go to the bank and say please give me 100 rupees to do x and then do y with it okay so there are certain end use requirements that i have to meet when i go to a bank so let's say i go to a bank and say mujhe crops ke liye loan de do then i can't use that money to make capital like to make a pond in my field right i can't uh, uh, use that money to dug, dig an irrigation canal i have to use the loan for a specific purpose uh, only right so the banks were also willing and gambling on the fact that okay let's give a short term 6 month loan because chhe mahine baad crop cycle aayega and then we will take the money back from him so the banks are also not willing to give long term loans and because long term investments are anyways not being provided by either the private sector or the public sector so the general agriculture infrastructure in the country is left lacking so i think if you followed the news a couple of years ago there were a large number of tribal farmers who had walked into pragati maidan in bombay right and they wanted to let's say protest so a very interesting issue is that the media sort of try to skew that issue and say oh all of these people who have uh, walked in they want to demand these as in they are, they are walking here for farm loan waivers right but these people if you look at the interview from the ground level these people don't want farm in, uh, don't want farm loan waiver because anyways most of these people have taken if they have taken loan they have taken loan from informal sources so if the government of india says that i am going to give a farm loan waiver it doesn't affect most of the farmers right it only affects the rich farmers who had the capital and who had the resources and the contacts to get money from the formal sector so it does not affect then who are the farmers who get money from the informal sector these are the poorest of the poor farmers right the socially down trodden so when the government says that i am going to give a loan waiver the farmers at the bottom rung of this entire system have no benefit out of it right so all these tribal farmers that had come to pragati maidan their issue was not loan waiver etc they basically said that under forest rights act a patta is issued which basically gives them entitlement to the forest land that their tribes had been ancestrally using so the main demand was that so the farmer in india has consistently been trying to tell the government that we don't need you please don't come in right so there's a very interesting in charismatic uh, farm farmer leader mr sharad joshi ji he was a civil servant and then he quit and then he became a farmer so he basically outlined and he basically gave this quote that the government is not the solution the government is the problem and he says the sort of policies that the government is taking the sort of intervention that the government is making the sort of let's say paternalistic and patronizing attitude that the government has adopted oh we need to protect these farmers liberalization agriculture mein nahi ho sakta ye to bechare lut jayenge so sharad joshi and people from that school of thought are saying let us be open to competition we we don't want your support we want you to get lost we don't want your intervention at all right so a lot of farmers are 
consistently be making these demands and because of the things that i explained to you i think it's fairly understandable also why farmers would think that government is not the solution and government is actually creating a lot of problems for these farmers okay so this was the issue of availability of credit now another uh, thing that i want to touch about is the freedom lack of freedom of choice and genetically modified foods right so <laughs> india was not allowing genetically modified few foods right so in around 2003 2004 this is called as the bt cotton satyagraha right so what happened was in so this seed had come into the market unregulated seed called bt cotton this was basically a genetically modified form of cotton which was pest resistant now it had been illegally planted by a lot of farmers in punjab maharashtra and akola district of maharashtra especially okay and the government was not giving any sort of approval for these gm foods now then suddenly there was a crisis in the sense that the bollworm pest struck okay and a large quantity of cotton crops in the country was destroyed now the only cotton crop that was left standing was the gm variety of cot crop that had been illegally planted by the farmers right so then there was a lot of pressure on the vajpay government and then they relented and they gave approval to two generations of bt cotton okay so now the same thing is happening again there is a third generation of bt cotton called htbt this is herbicide tolerate bt cotton okay so as the name suggests it so the problem with cotton is that it's a very highly labor intensive crop okay it's a commercial crop it has a good price i get all of that but it is a highly labor intensive crop and you have to remove the weed from the field by hand and that cost money because you have to hire a lot of labor so this is one of the reasons why a lot of farmers are quitting Uh, cotton growing so this solution came up in the form of generation 3 bt cotton seeds called the htbt cotton which is resistant to herbicide so now you don't have to pluck out herbicide from the ground you can just spray herbicide in the ground and the herbs will die but the cotton will be resistant to it now again the government is not giving approvals for this htbt cotton a lot of farmers have illegally started planting out i think in 2017 the the government report also has been sanctioned in this regard but uh, the results have not been made public but media sources say that about 15 to 16% of the cotton that is being growing in india belongs to the generation 3 htbt now this is being termed by the cotton farmers as a sort of as a sort of satyagraha right because satyagraha was what people so british government had said that you can't produce salt and gandhi ji said no everybody is producing salt it's not that gandhi ji was the only was the first person to produce salt people had been doing it in their backyards people had been doing it at their homes right but gandhi ji said that i have to make a mark of defiance and i because every, and this is something that everyone has been doing and and people had a sort of criminal mindset towards this in the sense they th they thought that they were breaking this law right so similar thing applied to these cotton farmers they started calling this cotton for grow variety a chor bt cotton right because they felt that wo chori kar rahe hain and they are going against the state so this was a sort of satyagraha where some farmer said nahi mujhe farak nahi padta i am going to draw bt cotton and then they fought and the government had to relent in so therefore this was termed as the bt cotton satyagraha so now the second satyagraha is going on with regards to generation 3 cotton now the interesting thing is that globally generation 4 generation bt cotton is being used and india sees only 15% of generation 3 htbt cotton okay now same is the story with bt brinjal it got all the necessary approvals in 2009 but now it's been 11 years and it's not being planted here okay so i think <coughs> the scientific community community is fairly clear i think a couple of years ago 100 nobel laureates wrote an, an open letter to the world community wherein they said that there are absolutely no harms of these genetically modified uh, crops and all of these oppositions are unscientific and billions of meals have been served all across the world without any sort of harm, harms being reported right so now bangladesh for example india is not approving bt cot bt brinjal but bangladesh has been growing bt brinjal and bangladesh has been really do going to doing well because the quality of brinjal that is being produced in bangladesh is good and it's getting good global prices okay now same is the issue with gm mustard and herein is the hypocrisy so the government is not allowing gm mustard even though both bt brinjal and gm mustard are be, sorry G, are have been created by indian companies okay bt brinjal is created by some mahiko maharashtra uh, based government think tank etc and gm mustard is it it delhi i think has put in some inputs here so these are all home grown technologies but the government is not allowing this but at the same time canada grows genetically modified mustard and so an indian farmer today who has traditionally been growing mustard for the last 3 4000 years like for last 4 500 years 
can not grow genetically modified mustard because the government says it is unsafe but canadian mustard which is genetically modified would say there is canola oil that is extracted from it and india can freely import that so you see the irony here right the indian farmers cannot grow gm mustard but if a farmer in canada is growing gm mustard we will purchase oil from them so this is a sort of another sort of problem that indian farmers are deliberately either deliberately or by systemic design are being de denied this free choice okay uh, just to sort of um, then there is a way yeah it's just i wanted to know how many slides are there if you don't mind because there is a you know technical requirement for... yeah are we out of time uh no we are absolutely on time it's uh, 4 uh, 45 it's just that there is a technical team requirement okay. to want uh, to test something urgently so they've requested us and i just wanted to know how many slides are there so that we could either cut it into two parts and maybe do it another do another one tomorrow okay so there are three three more slides okay great so but then they look quite exhaustive and interesting to me because you can't we can't do justice mm -hmm. uh, you know just rushing through them and uh, how much time would you really need to mm -hmm. you know them? what do you say 5 minutes so i think i need another 7 to 8 minutes uh, i will just maybe 5 sorry uh, okay Uh, I will just five minutes. Let's let's try and uh, because then, but then we'll not have any time for the questions at all. And I see that same mm -hmm. people have been there right from the start. They're still around because they find the topic very interesting. I'm sure. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I, my apologies to the people attending this webinar. It's sudden and it's very you know suddenly. I've received two three messages on here and on the phone. Uh, so I'm sorry. So uh, let's let's continue. Let's continue and close this. Yeah. Maybe they can ask questions on okay. you. Okay. Let me just try to. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'll try to wrap it up quickly then. Okay. Sorry. So then there is a major issue. No, no, no issue. Then there is a major issue with the APMCs and middlemen. Okay. So APMCs are the agricultural produce marketing committees. Okay. So Sharad Joshi had a very nice couplet in Hindi, which I want to reiterate here, which highlights the predicament of the farmers and the consumers. Right. So Sharad Joshi, from the perspective of a farmer, says, "Hum bhi mar rahe hain, tum bhi mar rahe ho. Hum sasta bech ke mar rahe hain, aur tum mehenga khareed ke mar rahe ho." Okay. So effectively, it says that most of the money that is being made by made out of agriculture is not made by the farmers. This money is made by the plethora of middlemen that the state has allowed to thrive. Okay. So APMCs, which stands for Agricultural Produce Marketing Committees, are a relic of the 70s. Now here again, APMCs were very important at that point of time because it was thought that a lot of these local level arhatyas and the village goons. Sort of traders, etc. They were exploiting the farmers. They didn't allow farmers to have an effective price discovery. They didn't let farmers know that market me kya rate hai. And they were purchasing stuff from the farmers in the first place. So the state came in, and in 1970s, a lot of so the central government gave directions. And since agriculture is a state subject, a lot of states also came in, and they passed their respective APMC acts. Okay. So what the APMC act does is that its its purpose effectively was to ensure that these farmers are not exploited by these traders and there is a government institution wherein the first sale would take place right so the farmers were as uh, in forced to sell their products in the in the apmcs so initially it worked out farmers realized oh that uh, these traders are robbing us we are let's say if they were buying stuff for 5 rupees now we are able to sell the same stuff in these mandis for 10 rupees but what the governments didn't realize is that they were creating this sort of monopoly right so let's say monopoly is when there is only one seller and that seller can then distort prices so the exact opposite of monopoly in economics is monopsony which means that there is only one buyer so initially there might have been traders which were exploiting the farmers but there was some sort of competition with these farmers right so some within these traders as well so farmers are getting some semblance of a reasonable price over the years these traders and arhatyas they basically occupied all the positions in the apmcs now what has effectively happened is that the state has institutionalized this sort of exploitation so initially the traders were using traditional methods now they have the full force and the sanction of the states to exploit these farmers okay so the the main issue is that the apmc acts they basically compel the farmer to make sure that the first sale is only in these mandis okay and the only exception is that if the farmer sells to the consumer directly 
and like think about it how many farmers actually go and sell to the consumers directly right so these farmers are supposed to sell off their goods in these apmcs right and now the apmcs are structured in this in, in such a way that they eliminate competition among middlemen right so let's say if the sort of if if, if let's say apmcs are uh, let's say reformed in in a way then it will benefit both the farmers and the consumers as well right let me give a very simple example like with the apmc structure in place with a lot of middlemen there farmers are selling let's say a good at 2 rupees a kg and then it goes through the apmc is where multiple fees are levied there is no competition farmers are exploited etc so they sell it for 2 rupees and the end consumer that is me i buy that same fruit or vegetable for 20 rupees now let's say if you are able to bring reforms in the apmcs and eliminate this extra money the farmer can now sell this for 10 bucks okay the middleman can make 2 3 rupees which is adequate for the amount of work that they put in and me as a consumer can now buy this buy this for 12 rupees so effectively there is an 8 rupee profit to the farmer there is an 8 rupee saving for the consumer and the middleman also in in a way get their fair share so it's not that these middlemen are evil people but it's just that the structure is such that there are no incentives for them to compete with each other and if there are no incentives then obviously the middlemen are not going to compete within the apmcs so that is one problem here now the next problem is with regards to the essential commodities act okay so essential commodities act is a successor of the british wartime regulations which was made sure which was passed to ensure that the supply of goods essential to the war effort could be controlled and there would be no holding etc right so the intention of the eca was this and the st indian state also put in the eca now with the, the problem with eca is that the essential commodities act gives the government the control over storage and sale price of any good which is included in a list of these community commodities okay so all the food items including oil seeds etc included in the list now the problem with the list is that there is a principle of delegated legislation so the parliament didn't decide what will be there in the list it's the state executive and the bureaucrats who will now, who will decide that what will be the good that are placed in these lists right so it didn't come from a primary source and it's basically the bureaucrats who will decide and the ministers etc who the executive basically who will decide which are the goods that can be placed here right so the problem here is that now the eca delegates this out to the executive at the center and the states and then they set the prices through detail delegated legislation which are called control orders okay so this basically means that there is no discussion or deliberative process to, to for any sort of restrictions to come in so sort of there is some sort of arbitrariness in the sense that the government can put in any commodity under the list in essential commodities act and it can give directions to traders so it can force traders to sell and sometimes these orders are made overnight ek din mein order aata hai that by tomorrow you have to sell all of these things okay so one of the largest problems that india faces in agriculture is that there are lack of adequate storage facilities right so because there are no storage facilities farmers can't store their sort of semi perishable material and if the markets are bad farmers can't store it and the farmers are forced to sell it at a lower price right now if there was adequate storage in place the farmers could obviously then store these food products and sell it at a later rate when the market prices would revive now the reason why there is no good infrastructure it can be effectively look at looked at from this perspective that the, since the essential commodities act creates the sort of system wherein any sort of arbitrary executive order could be made now no private sector investor is going to invest in warehouses right now let's say i am a private sector investor i construct a warehouse okay and let's say i put in 1000 kg of apples or wheat there and i am thinking i will sell this at a later date when the market is good now the government comes in says no no there is some sort of an emergency i i as you have to sell all your goods by tomorrow so where will the person who was running these warehouses make money right and now let's say and most of the how businesses work is this people will this person will not put all of his own capital he'll finance it through some debt so the banks will have to give money to the warehouse now the banks also realize that this is not a viable business opportunity because let's say if the government passes an order and says that you have to vacate our warehouse this guy has to sell it at a lower price and then he will not be able to make make repayments to the bank so banks also don't lend money to this warehouse so a people are not willing to put in their own money banks are not willing to put in money so the storage infrastructure in india is basically lacking with all of this right so this is another issue with the essential commodities act and um, finally i told you that i'll present you with a counterfactual in the sense that had all of these things been taken care of 
and had agriculture been also liberalized in the 1990s with every with everything else what is the sort of difference that we could see right so in 1991 india and china had comparable gdp so only today the china's gdp is five times india's gdp right and if you look at the history of the world every country that has liberalized and reaped the benefits of liberalization and globalization the first step that they took is to liberalize agriculture as well right so china struggled all through the 1980s to liberalize agriculture and mind you china is a country where the control of the land is with the state so in spite of the fact that all of the land is owned by the state china was able to in some way liberalize and open up agriculture let's say it freed agricultural trade then agricultural inputs were deregulated agricultural pricing etc were deregulated and trans china transformed its agriculture in those 10 to 15 years right similar is the case with south korea south korea and india were at the same level in 1950s in terms of per capita income and now south korea is a part of oecd which is the 24 richest countries in the world south korea liberalized their agriculture they faced these issues but within 30 40 years they came out of it similar is the example with new zealand new zealand till the 1980s and 90s was considered to be the laggard of the western world right and then they opened up they liberalized their agriculture and the situation today is that new zealand which is 10000 kilometers away from china sells more milk to china than india in spite of india having land border to china right because we just don't have the sort of market structures and incentives to promote some these business activities now as a result if you look at it in this context today china's agricultural gdp is larger than india's actual gdp now this is the sort of difference that agricultural growth in china has been has made okay so this is something that i'd like to leave you with when with regards to what you should be thinking about when you look at agriculture cases etc and to conclude i'd say that now india is holding so we talk about liberalization we talk about private sector opening up uh, we talked about open, having make in india but somehow we forget that agriculture is the largest private sector in india and agriculture is also the largest place where you can have